Well, good evening. And welcome to the Boardman Civic Association Primary Election Candidates and Issues Night. I'm Mark Luke, a member of the Boardman Civic Association. We're happy to have you here and happy to be here in our beautiful Boardman Park. We're here tonight to inform Boardman residents and interested community members on the candidates and issues on the May ballot. And also wanted to let you know that we do have some refreshments in the back of the room here, some uh, dessert uh, cookie brownies type things and some drinks if anyone's uh, uh, interested in those and of course after our, uh, our evening uh, forum has taken place. The issues this evening include Borman Local School District and Borman Township. The elected official races are Mahoney County Common Pleas Court Judge, the 7th District Court of Appeals Judge, and State Representative of the 59th District. We also want to thank this evening Borman Schools Television Network for being here this evening filming the forum for rebroadcast and we thank their advisor Amy Radinovic for joining us and our fine student Brandon Jackson for being here this evening. Thank you. Uh, but we have some guest introductions. We have trustees with us tonight. I know I saw uh, Mr. Larry Moliterno. Larry's here tonight, Borman trustee. Also with us um, some other elected officials. We have State Senator Joe Schiavone. Joe? Good. <laughs> Mahoney County Auditor Ralph Meacham. <laughs> Mahoney County Probate Court Judge Robert Russo. <laughs> and uh, I also want to introduce some other candidates that are with, a, with us here this evening that we're not invited to speak because they're not in contested races, but we want to recognize them for attending this evening. For the uh, a candidate for Congress, 13th District, Chris DiPizzo. Chris. <laughs> for State Central Committee, 33rd District, Monica Blaisdell. <laughs> for State Central Committee, 33rd District, David Johnson. For State Senate 33rd District, Michael Ruley. And also, Ralph Meacham, I neglected to mention, he is on the ballot uh, in May for the uh, auditor, Mahoney County Auditor's position as well. Thank you, Ralph. Mm -hmm. But this time, it's my pleasure to introduce the president of our Borman Civic Association for some updates and information, Mr. George Ferris. Mark, I just wanted to welcome everybody. Um, I'll be pitching you on membership in a second, but I wanted to recognize members of the group that are here tonight, or members of our board that are here tonight, or even if you're not here, uh, you could wave, give me a dirty look, do anything you want. Uh, you don't have to stand up. Um, we have uh, Stephanie Landers, uh, Mark Luke, of course, Jeff Barone, uh, also on the board of directors is Ms. Mrs. Marty Bushy, Meg Harris, uh, Karen McCollum, Kathy McNabb Welsh, Tim Saxton, uh, Rick Schaefer, Dan Segul, Tom Testa, and Kevin Willis. Thank you guys, appreciate it. <laughs> Mark, again, thank you. He does a great job. Does he, he does, he's our standing MC. He does a great job. <laughs> Sitting now. Yeah. A big fan of the First Amendment, right? Free speech, First Amendment, right? I couldn't understand why, but he told me that he has a friend in North Korea that doesn't have these freedoms. I said, I know. He said, I called him up and he, I asked how he's doing. He says, I, I can't complain. So, <laughs> nope, too late, too late. Okay, uh, real quick, the, uh, you know, I hope you enjoy tonight's, uh, it's not festivities, but information. This is what we do best, is provide information. It's our way of trying to make Boardman better. Everybody does, uh, has sacrifices. Uh, certainly nowhere near the sacrifices that some of our service people and others make, but it's our little contribution to the community to try to make Boardman better, keep everybody informed as much as possible, host these things um, so that everybody could get a chance to air their their side of it. I guess he like like Superintendent Saxon, he's like ready to jump up here and give his side, right? You know, so. <laughs> I, th I, th I, th I thought Frank Lazari was aggressive, but <laughs> but he does, Tim does a great job. Thanks, Tim. I know. And, and uh, 
we have three more events coming up tonight, or excuse me, coming up this year that are certainly worthy of your attention. The Scholarship Awards Dinner, which is April 16th. Uh, the Candidates and Issues Dinner, which is September 17th. Uh, and that is for the general election. This is the primary, obviously. So the general election um, is usually pretty well attended as well. And then the, the fun one, kind of, of the year, it would be our business mixer and wine taste, which we have at the um, Magic Tree. And it's going to be October 3rd this year, October 30th, excuse me. It's always the night before Halloween. So it, it should be a lot of fun. Last year was a big turnout, and it's a great way to network. So I hope you consider joining. We're going to have these sitting up here. Uh, it's $85 for the year. It's a great investment, and it's a, a good organization, as I think you'll agree. Uh, so with that, I think that's it, Mark. I'm going to take from it. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, George. Okay. Thank you. I don't know that guy in North Korea. I don't. I, I have no direct knowledge of anything concerning North Korea. So. Okay. Uh, and yet, you know, at our uh, April 16th uh, scholarship dinner, our speaker this year is President Jim Tressel from Exeter State University. So we very much look forward to that as well. We also have Boardman High School students joining us here to, uh, this evening from government classes, and we're excited about that because being involved in the process is very important, and learning these lessons at a young age is equally as important as well. So the forum. To our speakers this evening for these contested races in the May ballot, the evening's forum is not a debate. It's an informational format, as well as an opportunity to meet the candidates and issues representatives in person. Each speaker will have three minutes to introduce themselves or their issue. Mr. Kevin Willis will be the timekeeper. Kevin, wave to the crowd, stand up, thank you. Kevin is the timekeeper. Uh, he will signal when you have 30 seconds remaining, and then he will stand when your time has expired. Um, see the contested races. Okay, very good. We, we're taking a little discretion tonight because we have uh, uh, Joe Schiavone with us, and he's in a, gub is a gubernatorial candidate. And so we're taking the opportunity to let him come up here and speak for a few minutes this evening, as we don't have statewide candidates from our area very often. And he's a local person, a member of our organization. So we're asking Joe to come up and speak at this time. Joe? Well, I'm glad to be uh, home tonight. You know, I'm, I'm always somewhere, and it's great to see familiar faces, ones that I've worked with over the past nine years in the Senate. And so, you know, I'm not going to go into any background stuff. You guys, most of you probably know me, know that I've grew up in here, went to Borman High School, uh, represented injured workers as a workers' comp lawyer, got appointed 10 years ago to the Senate. And when I went down there, I didn't have any political experience, but what I knew is that we needed somebody different from this valley, and we needed somebody to go down there and get to work, and get to work on things that we needed changed in this community. And so I started working a lot on education issues because if you don't have education for our kids and they don't have opportunities, we're just going to lose generations of kids, not just in the valley but across the state. And I see this every day. So it's about making sure that we have proper funding so that you don't have to beg people on levies every single year. You know, it's about making sure that we have for-profit schools or we get them out of here, right? Nonprofit charter schools are fine, but when the goal is to make money, then the goal is not to educate. And I've seen a lot of that stuff. We need to make sure that we're investing in our communities at the local, local government level, because when you don't fund local governments properly, then they don't have the dollars to service the community. And again, you have to go back to the voters, ask them for additional you know, water fees and ask them for additional senior center levies. And that, this is what has happened in Columbus. They've cut local government, they've cut education, and what they've done with the money is they've put it in a rainy day fund or given it back in income tax cuts. Income tax cuts for me are okay once you actually invest thoroughly and properly in communities. And it's not just about throwing money at problems, it's about finding targeted investments and showing people that there's a government that works for them. And as governor, that's what I'm gonna do. I've rolled out plans on my website, it's joeforjobs.com. I've been running around the state for a year and a half talking about these issues. And it's not just me going into places and doing stump speeches and leaving. I've gone into communities and talked to them like human beings talked to them and listened and then brought their voices to the state house and based legislation based on the needs of the communities of the state. That goes a long way. That's grassroots. That's how you do this stuff. That's why we're going to win. And so we're going to continue to do that for the next six weeks and we're going to get it done. You know, it's 
For me, it's like I've already run two primaries. Because for the first year, I was running against the mayor of Dayton, the former um, congresswoman from Barberton, and a former state representative from Cincinnati. And then Rich Cordray jumped in in November. All three of those candidates went with his campaign. Then Dennis Kucinich decided he was going to run, and so did Bill O'Neill. So I'm now running a second primary when we've already run one for a year, but that's okay because it's given me the opportunity to go back to communities two, three, four times rather than just for that initial meeting saying, hey, vote for me because I'm the best. People know me, they understand that there's a plan and they understand on the Democrat side that we need somebody to make a change for the better. We can't just keep running the same old Democratic candidates and expect a different outcome. And so DeWine and Taylor are gonna be running on the Republican side and one of us is gonna run against one of them. And I think that as Democrats, we need to put up somebody new and somebody different against DeWine, who's the likely candidate. And if we don't, same result will probably happen. So that's the, that's the game plan. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. I don't know, were there questions? Okay, so no questions. That means get the hell out of here. I can handle it. Right? I'm out of here, I'll go to the next one. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. You're free to stay, Joe. It was not a bum's rush out the door or anything there. So, yeah. Yeah, but thank you. Okay, our first, uh, our first, we cover the issues first, then we get to the uh, electoral races, and uh, I'm sorry, to the candidate races. So the first issue this evening will be the Bourbon Local School District Levy, and the speaker is Superintendent Tim Saxton. You know, I spoke here uh, back, I think it was in October, you know, one of my challenges is keeping this under uh, a couple minutes, so I'm actually going to start this timer right here, and I'm not even going to worry about you, all right? It's right here, okay? That's going to be my biggest challenge, because talking about the Bournemouth schools is not a challenge. So first of all, what do we have? We have a, a $4.9 million emergency operating levy up on the ballot in May. That costs the... Uh, $100,000 homeowner in Borman, just a little under $17 a month, or about $205 a year. Why do we have it? Well, two big reasons. One, uh, if you remember some news in the fall, the hospital, a wing of the hospital got reclassified, and they pulled a million dollars out of our revenue. Just a million dollars gone like that. We never got it. People ask, why, why did you give it back? Well, we never got it. We couldn't even fight. Uh, why did you fight them? It, it's, it's not that simple. So we lost a million dollars in revenue just like that. But we're asking for $4.9 million, so some math says that, that doesn't add up. So we're, we're, what about the rest of it, Mr. Saxton? Well, the, the second piece of it exactly, and I'm glad Joe said that, is the Ohio school funding. The Boardman Local Schools are the only school district in Mahoning County under the school funding formula that is a cap district, meaning that the governor has said, here's the funding formula for Boardman, you should get more than we can give you. We just can't fund our own formula. We're the only district in Mahoning County in that situation. We've lost over $25 million since they went to that formula in 2012. This year alone is close to $4 million. They said that the formula should give us. We just can't fund our own formula. So when you take the Ohio school funding and you take that million dollars out, all we're asking for is that $4.9 million emergency, because it truly is. That hospital event was, was the spark that ignited this. Uh, what we're looking at is just to be truly funded, to maintain our programs. We're not looking to go beyond. We have excellent programs. We're looking for the proper funding to maintain those phenomenal programs. So when you see things like a fantastic student like Brandon back there with VSTN, or a proud graduate like Joe Schiavone of Boardman High School going on to great things, we want to keep that up. We're in our 100 year tradition. We want to keep those programs that we've had for 100 years and keep going for another 100 years. It's as simple as that. So if you want to hear more details about the, our financial situation, how we got in this financial situation, and how we plan to get out of it, we have a special meeting tomorrow, Tuesday, March 20th at 6.30 in the Borman High School cafeteria. So if you are a Borman taxpayer and you'll be voting on this, it's very important that you have an educated vote. This is not a levy rally tomorrow. This is a state of the schools meeting to explain the facts. It's an opportunity to the community to hear what's going to happen um, if it doesn't pass and understand our financial plan as we move forward. And it also will be an opportunity for the community to give us some input on that plan B as we design the future of Boardman. I'm under three minutes. <laughs> I figured I was the lead leg. I got to make sure I set the tone right. So 
I want to accomplish my goal, so I'm right at the three minute mark. Do you have questions for me? I do have a question for you. Yeah. Um, can you comment on how the district has attempted to or has cut costs in regards to their uh, annual budget? Great question. If you heard what I said, since 2012, 25 million dollars that we have not received in funding. So behind the scenes, we've been reducing staff. We've been staying, staying lean. Uh, we, we've, uh, our teachers, six straight years of 0% on, on the salary base. Just recently, we gave them a 1% uh, raise on the base salary, just recently. We've reduced positions. Last year, we reduced four positions through attrition. This year, no matter what happens in May, we call it Plan A. We are reducing a half million dollars out of our expenses. We're, through attrition, we're not replacing eight teaching positions. Okay, I don't have any further questions. Very good. Thank you very much, Tim Saxton. <laughs> thank you very much, Tim. And that meeting is tomorrow night, 6.30 in the high school cafeteria. You got it. Okay, We're thank you. 6.30 sharp. 6.30, okay. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> Superintendents, they're always taking attendance on you. Okay. Um, next up, the Boardman Township Levy. And speaking this evening will be Township Administrator Jason Lurie. Thank you very much for the invite. Um, I don't usually get up and speak in front of the group. I'm the kind of guy behind the scenes that keeps the township running. And uh, I'm very happy to be here on behalf of the township trustees. Uh, our two trustees couldn't make it. Um, Tom Costello um, had to deal with a, a family issue and Trustee Calhoun is at a school event. Uh, Trustee Molinterno is here. So I'm speaking on their behalf tonight to give you a little update on our levy. This is a replacement levy. This levy was originally funded at 3.2 mills and established in 1976. This levy is being replaced at a reduction to 2.9 mills. Uh, what this levy will do will cost a taxpayer 100, of a $100,000 home, roughly $60 a year. And this goes to fund your beautiful township that you live in uh, to keep our operations up to where they're at. I think a lot of you know we're the 12th largest township in the state of Ohio. We do some extraordinary uh, things that other townships do not do. We've started our landlord registration program, which we had to go to the Supreme Court and fight hard for to keep our neighborhood integrity intact. We have school resource offices in all of our schools. Um, really with the epidemics that have been happening in the school system, having a relationship with our officers in the school district has been vital to make sure we're able to respond and, and keep the schools safe. Uh, we've done our prescription drug drop-off box is very successful trying to keep the streets uh, free and clear of, of excess prescription drugs which seems to be uh, one of the leading causes for people to get involved with illicit drug use we also have an internet exchange program that keeps the trend for online shopping safe by coming to our township and having and, and our facility 24 7 the ability to exchange goods and goods that they purchase over the internet where you may do in a parking lot somewhere else that's not as safe uh, we have 144 miles of roads that we maintain in this township. We do a pretty good job, just so everyone knows. If you, if you live on a county road, we want to let, let you know that we do have a map to kind of illustrate county and state routes, so please make sure you check our website. We're trying to do the best we can with the dollars that we have, and, and with light of the local government cuts, and in light of the things that we've had to face here at the township, I think we've done a pretty good job with your taxpayer money. And, um, you know, with that, I wanted to keep it simple. I, I wanted to keep the message on point. Uh, we, I really can't say vote yes, but I can say thank you for the support we've received over the years to keep this community a nice place to call home. Thank you very much. Uh, just two quick questions, Jason. One, can you give us the difference between the, uh, the amount of money, the net dollars received at the 3.2 versus the 2.9 replacement? Sure. And then can you give us a fire station update? Great, oh, absolutely. Um, so a 3.2 levy would generate roughly $3.1 million. A 2.9 mil levy, which is the reduction, will generate close to 2.7. Um, the auditor's office, thank you for those numbers. Um, and then our fire station, it's moving quite along. If you've driven down Market Street, Route 7, uh, next to Center Middle School, across the mall, uh, it'd be hard to miss, but at Stadium Drive and Market, we're building a brand new fire station. That's a legacy building. The last time we've had that main fire station looked at several years back, we had mold issues twice, plumbing issues. Um, it was built in the 20s. This station 
is literally a 100-year building. Uh, it's designed to be centrally located to serve the public. It's moving quite along nicely. It was just in there today. Uh, I think Chief Pitcher is pretty happy to get the heck out of that old station. Uh, it served its purpose, and I think being where we're at, working with the schools on that, on that program to help find a property and swap that to be you know, close and, and keep people safe was just tremendous. I credit the trustees, I credit the schools. Um, to be able to work that out has been tremendous, and that's really why we have such a good community. It's, it's communication, it's innovation, it's talking, the people that we have there, so thank you. Yeah, I hope that uh, answered sure. your question. Absolutely. Okay, Jason, thank you very much for that update. Uh, next, we'll move on to our elected races, and the first one will be the Judge of the Court of Appeals, 7th District. We have two candidates here tonight. On the Republican ballot is Kathleen Bartlett, and the Democratic ballot is David Dapolito. We ask you two to come forward, please. And as we have reviewed, we will ask each candidate to give an introductory three-minute statement, and then we will have a question or two regarding that. So we'll go in alphabetical order. So Kathleen Bartlett, we ask you to speak first, please. I'd like to thank the Boardman Civic Association for inviting all of us to come here tonight and speak to all of you. I am Kathleen Bartlett and I'm running for the 7th District Court of Appeals. Um, I have been a magistrate in the Common Pleas Court in Columbia County for the past 12 years and as a magistrate I see firsthand the impact that our decisions have on the people who appear in front of us. Um, I know that my decisions don't change the world but for the people who appear in front of me it changes their world. Um, we may be selling off the family farm, we may be, um, I'm sorry, we may be determining who gets custody of the children, or we may be issuing protection orders for victims of domestic violence. So to those people, our decisions are important. Since our decisions are so important, it's important who we put into these positions. We need people who are fair and honest and have integrity and are dedicated to the service of the community. We need people who research the law and who write their decisions based on the facts in those cases. Um, it, I am always mindful of the impact that my decisions will have on people who, who appear in front of me. I never roll from the bench uh, or impulsively based on emotion. I reflect upon it and I apply the rule, rule of law to those facts. I have been a magistrate in the Common Pleas Court for the past 12 years, and I have been a magistrate for the Latonia Mayor's Court for over 22 years. Uh, I have been an assistant city law director for the city of Salem, and uh, I was in private practice for 12 years before all of that. I have practiced throughout the court's jurisdiction, Mahoning County, Columbiana County, Carroll County, um, and I have been a lifelong resident of Mahoning County. I was uh, raised in Greenford. I went to South Range High School. And my husband and I, we now live in North Jackson. So I live in one county, and I practiced in another county. So I have a lot of knowledge about the jurisdiction that the court serves. Thank you. Our next candidate presenting is David Dapolito. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. Thank, thank for, uh, the association for hosting this this evening. Uh, Mr. Saxon, I want you to know that I, too, am a proud graduate of Borman High School. Uh, I have been a lawyer for 29 years now. I have been on the bench for over 20 years uh, as a first, as the uh, county's first county court magistrate uh, appointed in 1997. I was then elected to the county court uh, judgeship in the year 2000. I've been reelected several times since then. I want you to know that the reason that I'm running uh, for this position is that I do not believe that the Court of Appeals is an entry-level position. I believe that it is a position that requires experience uh, from the trial court bench. Uh, I've been a lawyer that's tried civil and criminal cases for the past 29 years. I've also tried to uh, literally handle thousands of cases as a county court judge, both criminal and civil. Uh, I presided over those cases and I understand the pressures that the trial bench judge has. We decide issues in, in seconds, in moments, trial issues that are on the spot. We need to make a decision and they impact these cases immediately. On the Court of Appeals, 
they then hear these cases on review and they have cases, uh, case law, they have time, they have months to review our decisions that we make. Therefore, I feel that it's important that someone sits in the Court of Appeals that understands the uh, reality of what's happening during a trial and on the trial bench. Uh, again, I think that I'm the only candidate that has that experience uh, and that will have those decisions in mind uh, from the trial court perspective. Uh, I've always enjoyed great support from the people of Boardman. I want to ask you again for your support uh, in this election, and if there's any questions, I'll be happy to, to take any. Thank you all very much. Uh, we had a few questions. One, uh, you both actually covered the question of experience and commented on that. We understand that. There's another question we have. I think it's more of a process question about the court itself. I think many people understand some of the other lower courts because they may have some experience in them in their lifetime. The appeals court is a little different in that nature. So the question is basically around the process. How many employees would each judge have and how did they assist you? So, yeah, well, we go reverse alphabetical order on that. Okay. But yeah. I'm sorry, did you say we each have the same question? Yes. Yes, we each have the same question to answer. I was going to say, each judge has... Well, you can get up here to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take advantage of the microphone and the camera. Okay. We'll be fine with it. All right. Um, each judge at the Court of Appeals has three employees. You get a personal secretary and two staff attorneys to assist in writing the decisions. It's that simple, I, right? I, yeah. It's that, right? It's that simple. You guys don't want to help me. I mean, there's, 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 I mean, that's, there's, there's not much those are the employees. Okay. I mean, there are, there are, there's a court magistrate and a court mediator as well that they have now it appointed is. at the Court of Appeals, but each judge does get three employees specifically to them. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you both. Thank you. That's it. All right. Thank you, everybody. I have to work on getting better questions, I guess, is what I should be working on here. So, uh, I'm a non-compensated volunteer here this evening. So, Anyway, they'll pay me in brownies. Okay, the next um, race we have is the Mahoney County Common Pleas Court Judge. There are two, uh, two candidates on the Democratic ballot here this evening to address us. They are Dan DeCenzo and Anthony D'Onofrio. Gentlemen, if you please come forward. And again, just to review the format, you get a three-minute introduction, then any questions we have, you get two minutes to respond. So we'll go in alphabetical order. So we would ask first uh, to have a uh, opening comments from Dan DeCenzo. Good evening. Um, thank you for having me here tonight to speak with you for a few minutes. Thank you to Boardman Civics Association for giving us this opportunity. I appreciate it. I believe it's important. My name is Dan DeCenzo. I am currently a uh, magistrate in the Mahoney County Court of Common Pleas. I have served in that position since 2008 alongside Judge Lou Diapolito. Um, in, in the 10 years I've been there, I have presided over more than 10,000 cases, both criminal and civil. And the judicial experience that I've gained while serving over these past 10 years has truly been invaluable to me. Uh, a little bit of personal background about myself and my family. I was born and raised here uh, on the south side of Youngstown. I went to St. Dominic's and Cardinal Mooney. Uh, shortly after high school, I shipped off to uh, training in the U.S. Army and served six years as a combat engineer. Uh, during that time, I was fortunate to be able to attend college on the GI Bill um, while I was still in my service and I also worked my way through. Uh, I was fortunate to have opportunities to work several jobs, construction, uh, some truck driving jobs, things like that. But uh, it was a good opportunity and I took advantage of it and it helped pay for my schooling. Uh, after finishing school at YSU, graduating, I went on to law school at the University of Toledo and after finishing there, I came back here to Mahoney County to begin my practice where I focused mainly uh, on litigation and trial work. I represented a lot of local businesses in and out of court. I represented local labor organizations and unions, uh, again, in and out of court. Uh, and after having some successes in that area for, for 10 years or so, uh, Judge Diapolito selected me to serve as his magistrate. And 
I believe it's important for voters to know why somebody is seeking a position that they're seeking, why somebody wants to be put in a position uh, of leadership. And to that, I can say this. I've served in that court every day for the past 10 years. I'm aware of the profound impact that our decisions have on people that appear there. I care deeply about that court and the work that we do there. I love that court. It means something to me, not just only the work, but what the court stands for. And I believe this with my heart that people need to have a place where they know the deck isn't stacked against them. And they can go and they can get a fair fight. They can take on a giant. And if their case is strong, they can win that fight where anyone can stand equal with everyone. And I believe that that's what our court stands for. And because I believe that and I live it every day, that's why I'm running for judge. So on May 8th, I'm going to ask for your support to be the next Common Police Court judge of Mahoney County. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Our next candidate presenting is Anthony D'Onofrio. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Boardman Civic Association, for hosting this event. Um, for the last 27 years, I've uh, devoted myself to the practice of law, um, and I have the experience necessary uh, to serve on the Mahoney County Court of Common Pleas. I started out in that court as an assistant Mahoney County prosecutor, and for the first seven years of my career, um, I was in that court on a daily basis, trying criminal cases and even trying civil cases for the county. Um, I resolved thousands of cases essential to the protection of our families and our seniors, um, and I practice in that court to this day. Um, my career is very diverse and broad. I have a very broad base of legal experience. After I left the, the uh, Mahoney County Prosecutor's Office, I went into the practice with the law firm of Rossi and Rossi. And there, we did a general civil practice, so I was exposed to many areas of law that come before the Court of, of, of Common Pleas. Um, I left. Rossi's office to strike out on my own and I had a private practice for probably about 13 years of my career and um, I was looking for something a little different. I did the same type of work I did in the Rossi's office but I had an opportunity to come up at B.J. Allen Company where I became in-house counsel and I practiced there for about six and a half years and I was exposed to litigation all over the country. I was a point person on litigation from California all the way to Connecticut and um, was exposed to many, many different areas of law that are, um, that come before um, corporate entities. Um, I, since uh, my practice at uh, B.J. Allen started to interfere with my family life, I had an opportunity to come up with, with uh, come up for me at B.J. Um, at the city of Youngstown. At that time, uh, Chuck Samron offered a position for me as deputy law director for the city, so I took that kind of normalized my family life and it brought my career full circle back into public service. So half my career was in public service, half my career was in private practice. I was exposed to a great um, diversity of law, all which comes before the Court of Common Pleas. Very committed to this community. Um, my parents taught me the, um, it, you know, the value of honest public service. My, uh, family served the judiciary for over 50 years, and um, they've served with honor and distinction, and you've never heard a word of controversy about their service. And I've been given back to this community for the entire 27 years of my legal career. Um, I spent the last 17 years on boards that um, help families and individuals with drug and alcohol abuse, and I'm very proud of that service. I've learned about the struggles that addicts have. I learned about solutions to the problems, and I've learned that most importantly, I believe that there's hope for addicts, and I, I plan to um, um, utilize that on the court. And I've had the great support of this community and, and great leaders in your, com your community, such as Jack Nichols, who I've worked with um, as a prosecutor when he was a detective with the Borden Police Department. Um, I've been blessed to have this support, and I'd be honored to have your support and your vote on May 8th. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, I have a question here, and it's, uh, it's regarding the opioid crisis, which is very serious in, in our community. 
uh, read articles about it every day, unfortunately. So the question revolves around what tools does the court have to deal with the opioid problems in our community? It further goes on to kind of question the incarceration versus treatment. And it, it talks about that. So it's the, the, the basis of the question is incarceration versus treatment and what tools does the court have to deal with the opioid problems in our community? And uh, Anthony, we'll go with you first, please. My, first, my father started the first rehabilitation center in the city of Youngstown over 50 years ago, and that center is still in existence today. It's being operated by um, Meridian um, Healthcare. And that's one of the reasons that I want to be the judge. Mainly the main reason I want to be a judge is because I saw his ability to change the lives of thousands of people um, in his court. And um, he utilized programs that he studied all over the country and um, brought back to this area. As a result, they, they honored him by naming that facility after him. There are many different um, methods of treatment that can be utilized to solve drug problems. Um, I worked with agencies such as TASC that deal with indigent um, defendants who were exposed to um, alcohol and, and drug abuse, and um, there are uh, many monitoring methods that the, the modern day drug courts use to track that behavior. And there's intensive, there, you know, today there's medical assisted treatment, which is probably the most common treatment for opioid addicts. And, um, you know, it's a program that has to be monitored. The courts have to get involved in it. Judge Durkin has done a wonderful job with his drug court in um, graduating many um, persons who have overcome that addiction. So besides the, um, you know, the medical uh, aspect of it, um, the courts very um, closely monitor addicts in their courts, and there's, there's programs such as his where um, an addict would enter a plea of guilty, go through the program. Once they've gone through the program successfully, um, they'd have that charge removed. So, you know, that's, that's a great incentive for them to stay in the program. There's, there's a great rate of relapse, but I think Judge, uh, Judge Durkin does a great job instituting that program and other type of diversion programs for drug and uh, alcohol abuse. Okay. Thank you. I, one of the responsibilities I have in the common police court as a magistrate is handling arraignments. And I'll tell you this, over the last 10 years, during a, any given week, 10 years ago, eight years ago, we would have maybe 35 or so new felony cases. In my arraignment session last Tuesday, we had 65. Uh, Eight, ten years ago, you would have maybe 10 or 12 out of 35 cases that were felony five possession cases. Last Tuesday, I believe it was more like 45. And it was the people that came in, they were, could have been our neighbors, uh, old, young, white, black, women, men, it didn't matter. They were there. And they were picked up because they were in possession of illegal narcotics. Now, what that says to me is that the problem isn't going away. And I believe it's true when people say, you're not going to arrest your way out of this issue. It's something that needs to be, in my opinion, gotten ahead of as best as possible. Treatment is important. Um, oversight by the court with firm restrictions on individuals is important. But I also believe, and I would like more resources to be allocated to the courts to deal with prevention. Because that's the only way I think we're gonna get ahead of it, is by dealing with it before it becomes a lifelong problem because that's what addiction is and that's what treatment takes. Treatment isn't a systematic 30-day program and then boom, you're cured. That's not the way it works. So I would like to see more, al more resources allocated towards prevention along with treatment and oversight by the court. So that's one of the things that I would like to do and I would like to implement in the common police court is more prevention focused 
uh, programs too. All right. Yep, that's it. Okay, very good. Gentlemen, I don't have any further questions, but thank you both very much. And the next candidate race that we have is the Ohio State Representative 59th District. Two candidates on the Democratic ballot are Larry Malaterno and Eric Ungaro. Gentlemen, would you please come forward? Again, the format is three minutes for an opening statement. Uh, we will proceed in alphabetical order, starting with Larry Moliterno. Thanks. Larry? Appreciate the time here tonight. You know, it's funny going through this process because uh, I never really considered myself a politician. You know, I, I'm a lot of things. You know, I'm, I'm a dad to Lauren and Tyler. I'm a, I'm a husband to my wife Kathleen for 30 years. I'm a businessman running Meridian Healthcare with 300 employees. Um, I've been a teacher, I taught at YSU for 10 years. I've been a coach, I coached for over a dozen years here in Boardman Community Baseball. Uh, I admit I'm an overeater. Um, <laughs> I'm a lot of things, but really, I, I, I never considered myself a politician because to me, politicians are only focused on the next election, getting the next election. And I like to focus on the next generation, the next group of my, my kids, your kids, what can we do for them? You know, I go around in Boardman and I've been fortunate enough to be a trustee for 10 years. And people are, are, are so humbling when they talk with me about the successes that we've had in Boardman Township. Our police department, we've, we firmed up our police department by putting more policemen on the streets, more policemen in the schools, protecting our kids. We were the first community to be aggressively going after drug dealers in our community. We developed aggregation programs to save tax dollars or uh, utility dollars for our residents. Um, we've taken the lead in community collaboration. We formed the water district with Austin Town and Canfield to look at the, at the, um, the flooding problems. You know, we created, we regionalized the dispatching system for the county in cooperation with the sheriff's department. We've been doing a lot of those things. And so my thing is right now, how do we take these successes to the next level? Because I still hear things that I don't like. I still hear people telling my children and your children that if they're gonna be successful, if they're gonna be happy, if they're gonna have the quality of life that they want, they have to leave the Mahoning Valley. And we need to start coming together and say, we don't have to accept that, because I don't accept it. We have to come together to say, we can do better than that. And I know we can do better than that, and I see it, because I serve on the County Land Bank Board, and I see what redevelopment can mean. We have a project on the, north side, or the east side of Youngstown that's gonna create over 500 jobs. I see what we're doing in our schools to give kids more opportunities when they get done with schools, so that there are opportunities for them to stay here. So I know we can do better if we come together to do it. I also hear a statistic that for every case of senior abuse that gets reported, there's over 20 cases that don't go unreported. We need to come together and say, we don't accept that. We don't have to accept that way of life. And I know we can do better because I see it, I serve on the Mahoning County Advisory Council for the Area Agency on Aging. And I see what we did with our care call program in, in Borden Township. I know we can do better. And I still hear, and I still see families that their lives are, are torn apart because of the opiate problem. And I know we can come together to say, we don't have to accept that, we can do better. And I see it every day in my job. I see thousands of people entering into recovery and having successful lives. So I know we can do it. So it's time for us to come together and make some positive change. And you know, people right now, everyone's looking for endorsements. And the endorsement that I'm most proud of is the fact that the people of Boardman have elected me three times to serve as their trustee. And I see for our entire region, a great future is right there in front of us. We have to come together and grab it and take it because no one's gonna hand it to us. We gotta take it. And I'm asking you right now for your support on May 8th and we can do this together. Thank you. That's what's the <laughs> You're energetic. You're jumping up before I can introduce you. I'll That's make okay. Me. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> it's all right. Our next candidate for the 59th district is uh, Eric Ungaro. Thank you. Thank you. Does, this one, does this one work?
place to set up. Uh, all right, my name is Eric Angaro. Uh, presently, I'm a Poland Township trustee. Uh, I'm going to talk just about real quick two things that we've done in Poland just because I know there are issues out there that I'm very proud of. Uh, number one, we were the first department in Mahoney County and Trumbull County to start our officers using Narcan. Now, the reason was that because of the passion. I lost my brother about five years ago, and I've been very active in the community. But the first save was in Poland Township, and we made it very easy for everybody in Mahoning and Trumbull County for their police forces to get on, on board. And believe me, Poland Township, or Boardman, was right there with us, too. Number two is, you go around the, the Mahoney County area. We just got done inking a deal with Republic Services, where everybody gets free side curb pickup, the townships gets probably $600,000 a year, and the county gets about $5 million a year from off the backs of our carbon limestone out there. So those are just a few of the issues that I'd just like to touch on from that standpoint. Now let's talk about me. Married, two daughters, been a lifelong special ed teacher, lifelong football coach, 28 years, been a lifelong union member. I am who I am here and I, wherever else. Uh, some of those issues might not radiate. Uh, when we, we went down to the OEA convention in December, and we sat up there, and uh, Senator Savoni talked about it. There were seven, eight governor candidates. They all talked about two issues, schools and the opiate crisis. And I said to myself, half the people up there, the last time they were in a school was at a PTO meeting, or was, let's sit down and read a book to somebody. So when we're talking about education, when you're talking about fair shared legislation to beat our unions down, when you're talking about pass-through money and phantom income, and you're talking about cap, how it's capped, we're dealing with it now, we're getting smashed. I stand out there in all these communities, Poland's getting beat up, Youngstown's getting beat up, Borman's getting beat up, everybody's getting beat up. I donate my time, I stand on the line, and it's not politically helpful to me, but I believe in it because that's who I am. Now, from a union standpoint, we talked about it. 28 years in a union. It's who I am. It's what I'm about. It's what I believe in. You know what you're going to get there. Let's talk about the opiate situation. You can talk about continuing of care. You can talk about all the things that the big businesses have to do. When you lose a sibling and you either sit there and got to figure out in your life, am I going to sit around and drink every night and feel sorry for myself? Or are you going to start doing something? We created Solace of the Valley with ladies in this area to be the first group to come out and say, it's okay to talk about it. I'm a white guy, parents married, dad was mayor. It's all right, man, you can talk about it. And we've come a long way in five years. We got on the mental health and recovery board. At the time, there was a drug board and a mental health board. Guess what? The mental health board looked at the drug board and said, there's no way we're merging because we're not gonna go with the junkies, we'll never pass a levy. Well, we did, we consolidated. It was probably the best in the area, the, in the state dang near, smoothness. And you know what? We passed levy with, with flying colors and we're gonna have another levy coming up because I think more people are being hit on those. Uh, I know the hand came up. I, I don't know what I'm missing uh, other than just a simple fact. You, you know what you're gonna get with me. I, and, and I've been in politics my whole life. My dad was mayor. There's no friends and enemies in politics. There's great people on both sides of this race. And in the end of the day, I can tell you what, no matter who goes down there, you're gonna have a voice down there for the opiate situation. Uh, I just believe that I could bring a whole lot of passion from the educational standpoint, because when you talk about who's getting their head kicked in, it's me, it's teachers, it's coaches. Uh, I thank you, uh, I'm humbled, God bless everybody. And, and this is a phenomenal forum and that's it. Thank you, Eric. A uh, question we do have uh, for both of you. What are the three most important goals to achieve in your first term if, if elected as a state representative? Larry, we'll start with you. Well, the first thing I'm gonna do is continue my work in Columbus working on the opiate epidemic. Um, in the last 10 years, I've been in Columbus, gosh, I can't even count how many times I've testified. I've worked face to face with legislators. We've actually had language that we've carved in to some of the laws that have been passed over the last couple of years to make sure that there's more access to treatment. I'm very proud of the fact that, that we're doing that. Um, I also want to make sure that we're looking after our schools and listening to uh, Senator Schiavone today and a lot of the policies that he's enacted to support our, our public school system. It's absolutely what we have to do. And then lastly, as I said earlier, I think that one of the great assets that we have as a community is our excess of land. And I see that with the land bank. And what we want to be able to do is start to give incentives for local businesses to redevelop land, to take older buildings, let's, let's flatten them, let's rebuild on them, and let's give incentives for local businesses to be able to do that. 
I think, number one, first of all, growing up in the city, the, the whole idea of charter schools was created with decent merit. All right, why are you going to have minority kids have to go to a failing school? So what'd they do? We created charter schools. Now, okay, in theory, it sounded pretty good. If they are failing, you're not, you're not even accomplishing what you set out to do. So you're wasting all this money that could be in resources in our public schools with behavioral health agencies like Meridian or the Red Zone or all these other agencies, and you could be targeting these kids earlier. So there's number one. I'm going to have an annualization, and it's not going to be a Democrat-Republic thing. It's going to be, no, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher, so you have to listen to me. Like, I, I actually am in the schools. Uh, so I'm going to analyze all the charter schools. If you're failing, you need to be shut down. That money needs to be reallocated. If you're doing okay, that's great. You've accomplished what you wanted. So the whole funding issue would be number one. Number two, just a solid voice for families down there in Columbus as far as the opiate. If they see a, a state rep down there who lost a brother, who's been active in his community, volunteering his time, taking it away from my kids and my wife, I think that's going to go a long way to just give people a lot more heart. And then definitely working with the, the big agencies to make sure things go well. Uh, I, you know, the, the third issue, I'm a union guy. I'm sick of unions getting beat up, especially educators and professional unions. So I am going to stand up for them. So there you go. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, uh, those are all the candidates and issues we have for this evening. So we thank all the speakers for presenting and for all of you to, for attending this evening, including our high school students. We thank George Ferris for his promotional work and for being the uh, president and organizer of organization. Meg Harris, of course, for keeping us organized with Stephanie and Karen at the table there as well. And for Boardman Park for hosting us. You know, this, we're in the midst of their maple syrup festival and pancake breakfast. So they accommodated us by changing this room over. They're going to change it over again tomorrow back to the pancake breakfast setup. So we're very appreciative of the cooperation we get from our wonderful Borman Park. We do remind you that um, there are candidate and issues information on the table in the back. If you want anything, please stay, talk to these candidates. As we like to say, kick the tires, talk to them, shake their hands, look them in the eye, ask them questions, see who they are, get to meet them. It's a great opportunity for that as well. And um, also there's uh, a reminder for uh, to join us if you'd like to on our April 16th scholarship dinner. Uh, we'd love to have you. You know, an informed electorate is the responsibility of all Americans, which we owe to our forefathers and the generations who came before us. Those individuals who at great personal risk formed this nation and sought to its stewardship, as well as those who have served our country in a military capacity, all to preserve our way of life. We certainly hope you will consider exercising these freedoms we enjoy this May in the election and in many more in the future. Thank you, God bless, and good night.